hari hari It is important for Republican elders to endorse Biden to make clear to middle-of-the-road voters who will determine the outcome that it's safe to vote for him. We need to hear from the great and the good of what remains of the pre-Trump GOP. At Max Boot. And Tim Heidecker's response is, if we buy dad beer, maybe he won't hit us this weekend. Beef boy. Anyway, I'm going to be picking up on page 78, starting a brand new section called Art Beauty, Apparition, Spiritualization, Intuitability. The subsection is called More as Semblance. So we're going to be trying to get to page 90. Three. Does that seem possible? I mean, there's no easy page break around there. Let's see. That whole section ends on page 97. I'm not going that far. I'll just go to right to page 93. All right, picking up from the page break on, paragraph break on page 78. Nature is beautiful in that it appears to say more than it is. To wrest this more from that more's contingency, 
to gain control of its semblance, to determine it as semblance, as well as to negate it as unreal. This is the idea of art. This artifactual more does not in itself guarantee the metaphysical substance of art. That substance could be totally null, and still the artworks could posit a more as what appears. Artworks become artworks in the production of this more. They produce their own transcendence rather than being its arena, and thereby they once again become separated from transcendence. The actual arena of transcendence in artworks is the nexus of their elements. By straining toward, as well as adapting to, this nexus, they go beyond the appearance that they are, though this transcendence may be unreal. Only in the achievement of this transcendence, not foremost and indeed probably never through meanings, are artworks spiritual. Their transcendence is their eloquence, their script, but it is a script without meaning, or more precisely, a script with broken or veiled meaning. Although this transcendence is subjectively mediated, it is manifested objectively, yet all the more desultorily. desultorily. Art fails its concepts when it does not achieve this transcendence. It loses the quality of being art. Equally, however, art betrays transcendence when it seeks to produce it as an effect. This implies an essential criterion of new art. Compositions fail as background music or as the mere presentation of material, just as those paintings fail in which the geometrical patterns to which they are reducible remain factually what they are. This is the reason for the relevance of divergences from mathematical forms in all those works that employ them. The striven for shudder comes to nothing. It does not occur. One of the paradoxes of artworks is that they, is that what they posit, they are actually not permitted to posit. This is the measure of their substantiality. The more cannot be adequately described by the psychological definition of a gestalt, according to which a whole is more than its parts. For the more is not simply the nexus of the elements, but an other, medi mediated through this nexus and yet divided from it. The artistic elements suggest through their nexus what escapes it. Here one comes up against an antinomy of the philosophy of history. In his treatment of the theme of aura, a concept closely related to the concept of the appearance that by virtue of its internal unity points beyond itself, Benjamin showed that, beginning with Baudelaire, aura in the sense of atmosphere is taboo. Already in Baudelaire, the transcendence of the artistic appearance is at once effected and negated. From this perspective, the de-aestheticization of art is not only a stage of art's liquidation, but also the direction of its development. All the same, the socialized rebellion since Baudelaire against aura and atmosphere has not meant the simple disappearance of the crackling noise in which the more of the phenomenon announces itself in opposition to this phenomenon. One need only compare good poems by Brecht that are styled as particle sentences with bad poems by authors whose rebellion against being poetic recoils into the pre-aesthetic. In Brecht's disenchanted poetry, what is fundamentally distinct from what is simplistically stated constitutes the work's eminent rank. Eric Kahler may have been the first to recognize this, and it is best confirmed by the poem Two Cranes. Aesthetic transcendence and disenchantment converge in the moment of falling mute. In Beckett's oeuvre, a language, a language remote from all meaning is not speaking is not a speaking language, and this is its affinity to muteness. Perhaps all expression, which is most akin to transcendence, is as close to falling mute as in great new music. Nothing is so full of expression as what flickers out, that tone that disengages itself starkly from the dense musical texture where art, by virtue of its own movement, converges with its natural element. The instant of expression in artworks is, however, not the reduction to the level of the materials as to something unmediated. Rather, this instant is fully mediated. Artworks become appearances in the pregnant sense of the term, that is, as the appearance of an other, 
when the accent falls on the unreality of their own reality. Artworks have the imminent character of being an act, even if they are carved in stone, and this, this endows them with the quality of being something momentary and sudden. This is registered by the feeling of being overwhelmed when faced with an important work. This imminent character of being an act establishes the similarity of all artworks, like that of natural beauty, to music, a similarity once evoked by the term muse. Under patient contemplation, artworks begin to move. To this extent, they are truly after images of the primordial shudder in the age of reification. The terror of that age is recapitulated vis-a-vis -vis reified objects. The deeper the Greek word between these circumscribes, particular things and the paling essence, the more hollowly artworks gaze, the sole anamnesis of what could exist beyond the Greek word. Because the shudder is past and yet survives, artworks objectivate it as its after image. For if at one time human beings in their powerlessness against nature feared the shudder as something real, the fear is no less intense, no less justified that the shudder will dissipate. All enlightenment is accompanied by the anxiety that what set enlightenment in motion in the first place and what enlightenment ever threatens to consume may disappear, truth. Thrown back on itself, enlightenment distances itself from that guileless objectivity that it would like to achieve. That is why, under the compulsion of its own ideal of truth, it is conjoined with the pressure to hold on to what it has condemned in the name of truth. Art is this mino sign. <clears throat> the instant of appearance in artworks is indeed the paradoxical unity or the balance between the vanishing and the preserved. Artworks are static as much as they are dynamic. Art genres that fall below approved cultures, such as circus tableau and reviews, and probably mechanisms such as the water fountains of the 17th century, confess to what authentic artworks conceal in themselves as their secret a priori. Artworks remain enlightened because they would like to make commensurable to human beings the remembered shudder, what, which was incommensurable in the magical primordial worlds. This is touched upon by Hegel's formulation of art as the effort to do away with foreignness. In the artifact, the shudder is freed from the mythical deception of its being in itself, without, however, the works being reduced to subjective spirit. The increasing autonomy of artworks, their objectivation by human beings, presents the shudder as something unmollified and unprecedented. The act of alienation in this objectivation which each artwork carries out is corrective. Artworks are neutralized and thus qualitatively transformed epiphanies. If the deities of antiquity were said to appear fleetingly as their cult sites, or at least were to have appeared there in the primeval age, this act of appearing became the law of the permanence of artworks, but at the price of the living incarnation of what appears. The artwork as appearance is most closely resembled by the apparition, the heavenly vision. Artworks stand tacitly in accord with it as it rises above human beings and is carried beyond their intention and the world of things. Artworks from which the apparition has been driven out without a trace are nothing more than husks, worse than what merely exists. Because they are not even useful, artworks Artworks are nowhere more reminiscent of manna than in their extreme opposition to it, in the subjectively posited construction of ineluctability. That instance, which is what artworks are, crystallized, at least in traditional works, at the point where out of their particular elements they became a totality. The pregnant moment of their objectivation is the moment that concentrates them as appearance which is by no means just the expressive elements that are dispersed over the artworks. Artworks surpass the world of things by what is thing-like in them, their artificial objectivation. They become eloquent by the force of the kindling of, thing, of things and appearance. They are things whose power it is to appear. The imminent process is externalized as their own act, not as what humans have done to them, and not merely for humans. The phenomenon of fireworks is prototypical for artworks. 
but because of its fleetingness and status as empty entertainment, it has scarcely been acknowledged by theoretical consideration. Only Valéry pursued ideas that are at least related. Fireworks are apparition Greek word. They appear empirically, yet are liberated from the burden of the empirical, which is the obligation of duration. They are a sign from heaven, yet artifactual, an ominous warning, a script that flashes up, vanishes, and indeed cannot be read for its meaning. The segregation of the aesthetic sphere by means of the complete afunctionality of what is thoroughly ephemeral is no formal definition of aesthetics. It is not through a high perfection that artworks separate from the fall fallibly existent, but rather by becoming actual, like fireworks, incandescently in an expressive appearance. They are not only the other of the empirical world, everything in them becomes other. It is this to which the pre-artistic consciousness of artworks responds most intensely. This consciousness submits to the temptation that first led to art and that mediates between art and the empirical. Although the pre-artistic dimension becomes poisoned by its exploitation to the point that artworks must eliminate it, it survives sublimated in them. It is not so much that artworks possess ideality as that by virtue of their spiritualization, they promise a blocked or denied sensuality. That quality can be comprehended in those phenomena from which artistic experience emancipated itself, in the relics of an art alien art, as it were, the justly or unjustly so-called lower arts such as the circus, to which in France the Cubist painters and the theoreticians turned, and to which in Germany Vedican turned. But the Vedican called corporeal art has not only remained beneath spiritualized art, not only remained just its complement. In its intentionless, however, intentionlessness, however, it is the archetype of spiritualized art. By its mere existence, every artwork, as alien artwork to what is alienated, conjures up the circus and yet is lost as soon as it emulates it. Art becomes an image not directly by becoming an apparition, but only through the counter tendency to it. The puritistic level of art is at the same time the memento of its anti cultural character, its suspicion of its antithesis to the empirical world that leaves this world untouched. Important artworks nevertheless seek to incorporate this art alien layer. When suspected of being infantile, it is absent from art, and the last trace of the vagrant fiddler disappears from the spiritual chamber musician, and the illusionless drama has lost the magic of the stage. Art has capitulated. The curtain lifts expectantly even at the beginning of Beckett's endgame. Plays and stagings that eliminate the curtain fumble with a shallow trick. The instant the curtain goes up is the expectation of the apparition. If Beckett's plays, as crepuscularly gray as after sunset and the end of the world, want to exercise the circus colors, they yet remain true to them in that the plays are indeed performed on stage, and it is well known how much their anti-heroes were inspired by clowns in slapstick cinema. Despite their austerity, they in no way fully renounce costumes and sets. The servant Clove, who wishes to in vain to break out, wears the laughably outmoded costume of a traveling Englishman, and the sand hill of happy days bears a similarity to geological formations of the American West. In general, the question remains whether in their material and visual organization, even the most abstract paintings do not bear elements of a representability of a representationality that they hope to remove from circulation. Even artworks that incorruptibly refuse celebration and consolation do not wipe out radiance, and the greater their success, the more they gain it. Today, this luster devolves precisely upon works that are inconsolable. Their distance from any purpose sympathizes, as from across the abyss of ages, the superfluous vagrant who will not completely acquiesce to fixed property and settled civilization. 
not least among the contemporary difficulties of art is that artworks are ashamed of apparition, though they are unable to shed it. No longer substantial in the Hegelian sense, having become self-transparent right into their constitutive semblance, which artworks find untrue in its transparentness, this transparentness gnaws away at their possibility. An inane Wilhelmian army joke tells of an orderly who one fine Sunday morning is sent by his superior to the zoo. He returns very worked up and declares, Lieutenant, animals like that do not exist. This form of reaction is as requisite of aesthetic experience as it is alien to art. Artworks are eliminated along with the youthful Greek word. Cles Angelus Novus arouses this astonishment much as do the semi-human creatures of Indian mythology. In each genuine artwork, something appears that does not exist. It is not dreamt up out of disparate elements of the existing. Out of these elements, artworks arrange constellations that become ciphers, without, however, like fantasies, setting up the enciphered before the eyes as something immediately existing. The encipherment of the artwork, one facet of its apparition, is thus distinct from natural beauty in that while it too refuses the univocity, univocity of judgment, nevertheless in its own form, in the way in which it turns toward the hidden, the artwork achieves a greater determinacy. Artworks thus vie with the syntheses of significative thinking, their irreconcilable enemy. <coughs> He's very much doing the thing where one sentence immediately contradicts the one preceding it. The appearance of the non-existent as if it existed motivates the question as to the truth of art. By its form alone, art promises what is not. It registers objectively, however refractively, the claim that because the non-existent appears, it must indeed be possible. The unstillable longing in the face of beauty, for which Plato found words fresh with its first experience, is the longing for the fulfillment of what was promised. Idealist aesthetics fails by its inability to do justice to art's promise du bonheur, it reduces the artwork to what it in theoretical terms symbolizes and thus trespasses against the spirit in that artwork. What spirit promises, not the sensual pleasure of the observer, is the locus of the sensual element in art. Romanticism wanted to equate what appears in the apparition with the artistic. In doing so, it grasped something essential about art, yet narrowed it to a particular the praise of a specific and putatively inward infinite comportment of art. In this, Romanticism imagined that through reflection and thematic content, it could grasp art's ether, whereas it is irresistible precisely because it refuses to let itself be nailed down either as an entity or as a universal concept. Its ether is bound up with particularization it epitomizes the unsubsumable and as such challenges the prevailing principle of reality, that of exchangeability. What appears is not interchangeable because it does not remain a dull particular for which other particulars could be substituted, nor is it an empty universal that equates everything specific that it comprehends by abstracting the common characteristics. If in empirical reality, everything has become fungible, art holds up to the world of everything for something else. Images of what it itself would be if it were emancipated from the schemata of imposed identification. Yet art plays over into ideology in that, as the image of what is beyond exchange, it suggests that not everything in the world is exchangeable. On behalf of what cannot be exchanged, art must through its form bring the exchangeable to critical self-consciousness. The telos of artworks is a language whose words cannot be located on the spectrum, a language whose words are not imprisoned by a pre-stabilized universality. 
an important suspense novel by Leo per Perutz, concerns the color drama to red. Subartistic genres such as science fiction prejudicely and therefore powerlessly make a fetish of such themes. Although the non-existing emerges suddenly in artworks, they do not lay a hold of it bodily as with the pass of a magic wand. The non-existing is mediated to them through fragments of the existing, which they assemble into an apparition. It is not for art to decide by its existence if the non-existing that appears indeed exists as something appearing or remains semblance. As figures of the existing, unable to summon into existence the non-existing, artworks draw their authority from the reflection they compel on how they could be the overwhelming image of the non-existing if it did not exist in itself. Precisely Plato's ontology, more congenial to positivism than dialectic is, took offense at art's semblance character, as if the promise made by art awakened doubt in the positive omnipresence of being an idea for which Plato hoped to find surety in the concept. If the Platonic ideas were existence in itself, art would not be needed. The ontologists of antiquity mistrusted art and sought pragmatic control over it because in their innermost being they knew that the hypostatized universal concept is not what beauty promises. Plato's critique of art is indeed not compelling because art negates the literal reality of its thematic content, which Plato had indicated, indicted as a lie. The exaltation of the concept as idea is allied with a Philistine blindness for the central element of art, its form. In spite of all this, however, the blemish of mendacity obviously cannot be rubbed off art. Nothing guarantees it will keep its objective promise. Therefore, every theory of art must at the same time be the critique of art. Even radical art is a lie insofar as it fails to create the possible to which it gives rise as semblance. Artworks draw credit from a praxis that has yet to begin, and no one knows whether anything backs their letters of credit. Artworks are images as apparition, as appearance, and not as a copy. If through the demythologization of the world, consciousness freed itself from the ancient shudder, that shudder is permanently reproduced in the historical antagonism of subject and object. The object became as incommensurable to experience, as foreign and frightening as manna once was. This permeates the image character. It manifests foreignness at the same time that it seeks to make experiential what is thing-like and foreign. For artworks, it is incumbent to grasp the universal, which dictates the nexus of the existing and is hidden by the existing in the particular. It is not for art, through particularization, to disguise the ruling universality of the administered world. Totality is the grotesque air of manna. The image character of artworks passed over into totality, which appears more truly in the individual than in the syntheses of singularities. By its relation to what in the constitution of reality is not directly accessible to discursive conceptualization and nonetheless objective, art in the age of enlightenment holds true to enlightenment while provoking it. What appears in art is no longer the ideal, no longer harmony, the locus of its power of resolution is now exclusively in the contradictory and dissonant. Enlightenment was always also the consciousness of the vanishing of what it wanted to seize without any residue of mystery. By penetrating the vanishing, the shudder, enlightenment not only is its critique, but salvages it according to the measure of what provokes the shudder in reality itself. This paradox is appropriated by artworks. If it holds true that the subjective rationality of means and ends, which is particular and thus in its innermost irrational, requires spurious irrational enclaves and treats art as such, art is nevertheless the truth of society insofar as in its most authentic products, the irrationality of the rational world order is expressed. In art, denunciation and anticipation are syncopated. 
if apparition illuminates and touches, the image is the paradoxical effort to transfix this most evanescent instant. In art, something momentary transcends. Objectivation makes the artwork into an instant. Pertinent here is Benjamin's formulation of a dialectic at a standstill, which he developed in the context of his conception of a dialectical image. If, as images, artworks are the persistence of the transient, they are concentrated in appearance as something momentary. To experience art means to become conscious of its imminent process as an instant at a standstill. This may perhaps have nourished the central concepts of Lessing's aesthetics, that of the pregnant moment. Artworks not only produce imagines as something Artworks not only produce imagines as something that endures, imagines as something that endures, they become artworks just as much through the destruction of their own imagerie. For this reason, art is profoundly akin to explosion. When in Vatican's spring awakening, Moritz Stiefel shoots himself dead with a water pistol and the current falls as he says, now I won't ever be going home again, in this instant, as dusk settles over the city in the far distance, the unspeakable melancholy of the river landscape is expressed. Not only are artworks allegories, they are the catastrophic fulfillment of, al of allegories. The shocks inflicted by the most recent artworks of the explosion of their appearance. In them, appearance, previously a self-evident a priori of art, dissolves in a catastrophe in which the essence of appearance is for the first time fully revealed, and nowhere perhaps more unequivocally than in Walls's paintings. Even this viol volatilization of aesthetic transcendence becomes aesthetic, a measure of the degree to which artworks are mythically bound up with their antithesis. In the incineration of appearance, artworks break away in a glare from the empirical world and become the counterfigure of what lives there. Art today is scarcely conceivable except as a form of reaction that anticipates the apocalypse. Closely observed, even tranquil works discharge not so much the pent-up emotions of their makers as the work's own inwardly antagonistic forces. The result of these forces is bound up with the impossibility of bringing these forces to any equilibrium. Their antinomies, like those of knowledge, are unsolvable in the unreconciled world. The instant in which these forces become image, the instant in which what is interior becomes exterior, the utter husk is exploded. Their apparition, which makes them an image, always at the same time destroys them as image. In Benjamin's interpretation, Baudelaire's fable of the man who lost his aureole describes not just the demise of art, of aura, but aura itself. If artworks shine, the objectivation of aura is the path by which it perishes. As a, as a result of its determination as appearance, art bears its own negation embedded in itself as its own telos. The sudden unfolding of appearance disclaims aesthetic semblance. Appearance, however, and its explosion in the artwork are essentially historical. The artwork in itself is not, as historicism would have it, as if its history accords simply with its position in real history. Being absolved from becoming. Rather, as something that exists, the artwork has its own development. What appears in the artwork is its own inner time. The explosion of appearance blasts from the continuity of this inner temporality. The artwork is mediated to real history by its monadological nucleus. History is the content of artworks. To analyze artworks means no less than to become conscious of the history imminently sedimented in them. The image character of works, at least in traditional art, is probably a function of the pregnant moment. This could be illustrated by Beethoven's symphonies and above all in many of his sonata movements. Movement at a standstill is eternalized in the instant. What has been made eternal is annihilated by its reduction to the instant. This marks the sharp difference of the image character of art from how Kleges and Jung conceived it. 
if after the separation of knowledge into image and sign, thought simply equates the image with truth, the untruth of the schism is in no way corrected but made all the worse, for the image is no less affected by the schism than is the concept. Aesthetic images are no more translatable into concepts than they are real. There is no imago without the imaginary. The reality is their historical content, and the images themselves, including the historical images, are not to be hypostatized. Aesthetic images are not fixed, archaic invariants. Artworks become images in that the processes that have congealed in them as objectivity become eloquent. Bourgeois art religion of Dilthian provenance confused the imagerie of art with its opposite, but the artist's psychological repository of representations. But this repository is itself an element of the raw material forged into the artwork. The latent processes in artworks, which break through in the instant, are their inner historicity sedimented external history. The binding character of their objectivation, as well as the experiences from which they live, are collective. The language of artworks is, like every language, constituted by a collective undercurrent especially in the case of those works popularly stigmatized as lonely and walled up in the ivory tower. The eloquence of the collective substance originates in their image character and not in the testimony, as the cliché goes, that they supposedly wish to express directly to the collective. The specifically artistic achievement is an overarching binding character to be ensnared not thematically or by the manipulation of effects, but rather by presenting what is beyond the modad through immersion in the experiences that are fundamental to this bindingness. The result of the work is as much the trajectory it traverses to its imago as it is the imago itself as the goal. It is at once static and dynamic. Subjective experiences, subjective experience contributes images that are not images of something and precisely they are essentially collective. Thus, and in no other way, is art mediated to experience. By virtue of this experiential content, and not primarily as a result of fixation or forming as they are usually conceived, artworks diverge from empirical reality, empiria through empirical deformation. This is the affinity of artworks to the dream, however far removed they are from dreams by the law of form. This means nothing less than that the subjective elements of artworks is mediated by their being in themselves. The latent collectivity of this subjectivity frees the monadological artwork from the accidentalness of its individuation. Society, the determinant of experience, constitutes artworks as their true subject. This is the needed response to the current reproach of subjectivism raised to art by both left and right. At every aesthetic level, the antagonism between the unreality of the imago and the reality of the appearing historical content is renewed. The aesthetic images, however, emancipate themselves from mythical images by subordinating themselves to their own unreality. That is what the law of form means. This is the artwork's mythesis, mythesis in enlightenment. The view of art as politically engaged or didactic regresses back at this stage of enlightenment. Unconcerned with the reality of aesthetic images, this view shuffles away the antithesis of art to reality and it integrates art into the reality it opposes. Only those artworks are enlightened that, vigilantly distant from the empirical, evince true consciousness. That through which artworks, by becoming appearance, are more than they are, this is their spirit. The determination of artworks by spirit is akin to their determination as phenomenon, as something that appears and not as blind appearance. What appears in artworks and is neither to be separated from their appearance nor to be held simply identical with it, the non-factual in their facticity, is their spirit. 
It makes artworks, things among things, something other than thing. Indeed, artworks are only able to become other than thing by becoming a thing, though not through their localization in space and time, but only by an imminent process of reification that makes them self-same, self-identical. Otherwise, one could not speak of their spirit, that is, of what is utterly unthing-like. Spirit is not simply spiritus, the breath that animates the work as a phenomenon. Spirit is as much the force of the interior of works, the force of their objectivation. Spirit participates in this force no less than in the phenomenality that is contrary to it. The spirit of artworks is their imminent mediation, which transforms their sensual moments and their objective arrangement. This is mediation in the strict sense that each and every element in the artwork becomes manifestly in its own other, becomes manifestly its own other. The aesthetic concept of spirit has been severely compromised, not only by idealism, also by writings dating from the nascence of radical modernism, among them those of Kandinsky. In his justified revolt against sensualism, which even in Jugendstil accorded a preponderance to sensual satisfaction, Kandinsky abstractly isolated the contrary to, of this principle and reified it so that it became difficult to distinguish the you should believe in spirit from superstition and an arts and crafts enthusiasm for the exalted. The spirit in artworks transcends equally their status as a thing and a central phenomenon, and indeed only exists insofar as there are among its elements, as these are among its elements. Put negatively, in artworks nothing is literal, least of all their words. Spirit is their ether, which speaks through them, or more precisely, what makes artworks become script. Although nothing counts in artworks that does not originate in the configuration of their central elements, all other spirit in the artworks, particularly injected philosophical thematics and putatively expressed spirit, all discursive ingredients are material like colors and tones. The central in artworks is artistic only if in itself mediated by spirit. Even the essentially most dazzling French works achieve the rank by the involuntary transformation of the essential elements into bearers of a spirit whose experiential content is melancholic resignation to mortal sensual ex existence. Never do these works relish their suaveness to the full, for that suaveness is always curtailed by the sense of form. The spirit of artworks is objective, regardless of any philosophy of objective or subjective spirit. This spirit is their own content and it passes judgment over them. It is the spirit of the thing itself that appears through the appearance. Its objectivity has its measure in the power with which it infiltrates the appearance. Just how little the spirit of the work equals the spirit of the artist which is at most one element of the former, is evident in the fact that spirit is evoked through the artifact, its problems, and its material. Not even the appearance of the artwork as a whole is its spirit, and least of all is it the appearance of the idea purportedly embodied or symbolized by the work. Spirit cannot be fixated in immediate identity with its appearance but neither does spirit constitute a level above or below appearance. Such a supposition would be no less of a reification. The locus of spirit is the configuration of what appears. Spirit forms appearance just as appearance forms spirit. It is the luminous source through which the phenomenon radiates and becomes a phenomenon in the most pregnant sense of the word. The sensual exists in art only spiritualized and refracted. This can be elucidated by the category of critical situation in important artworks of the past, without the knowledge of which the analysis of works would be fruitless. <coughs> Just before the beginning of the reprise of the first movement of Beethoven's Kreitzer Sonata, which Tolstoy defamed as sensuous, the secondary 
subdominant produces an immense effect. Anywhere outside the Kreutzer Sonata, the same chord would be more or less insignificant. The passage only gains significance through its place and function in the movement. It becomes crucially significant in that through its hick and nunc, it points beyond itself and imparts the feeling of a critical situation of what precedes and follows it. This feeling cannot be grasped as an isolated central quality, yet through the central constellation of two chords at a critical point, it becomes as irrefutable as only something central can be. In its aesthetic manifestation, spirit is condemned to its locus in the phenomenon just as spirits were once thought to have been condemned by their to their haunts. If spirit does not appear, the artworks are as negligible as that spirit. Spirit is indifferent to the distinction drawn by the history of ideas between sensual and idealistic art. Insofar as there is sensual art, it is not simply sensual but embodies the spirit of sensuality. Wittgen's concept of carnal spirit registered this. Spirit, art's vital element, is bound up with art's truth content, though without conceding to it. The spirit of works can be untruth, for truth content postulates something real as its substance, and no spirit is immediately real. With an ever-increasing ruthlessness, spirit determines and pulls everything merely sensual and factual in artworks into its own sphere. Artworks thereby become more secular, more opposed to mythology, to the illusion of spirit, even its own spirit, as real. Thus artworks radically mediated by spirit are compelled to consume themselves. Through the determinate negation of the reality of spirit, however, these artworks continue to refer to spirit. They do not feign spirit, rather they, the force they mobilize against it is spirit's omnipresence. Spirit today is not imaginable in any other form. Art offers its prototype. As tension between the elements of the artwork and not as an existence sui generis, art's spirit is a process and thus it is the work itself. To know an artwork means to apprehend this process. The spirit of artworks is not a concept, yet through spirit, artworks become commensurable to the concept. By reading the spirit of artworks out of their configurations and confronting the elements with each other and with the spirit that appears in them, critique passes over into the truth of the spirit, which is located beyond the aesthetic configuration. This is why critique is necessary to the works. In the spirit of the works, critique recognizes their truth content or distinguishes truth content from spirit. Only in this act, and not through any philosophy of art that would dictate to art what its spirit must be, do art and philosophy converge. The strict eminence of the spirit of artworks is contradicted, on the other hand, by a counter-tendency that is no less eminent. The tendency of artworks to wrest themselves free of the internal unity of their own construction, to introduce within themselves caesuras that no longer permit the totality of the appearance. Because the spirit of the work is not identical with them, spirit breaks up the objective form through which it is constituted. This rupture is the instant of apparition. If the spirit of artworks were literally identical with their central elements and their organization, spirit would be nothing but the quintessence of the appearance. The repudiation of this thesis amounts to the rejection of idealism. If the spirit of artworks flashes up in their central appearance, it does so only as their negation. Unitary with the phenomenon, spirit is at the same time its other. The spirit of artworks is bound up with their form but spirit is such only insofar as it points beyond that form. The claim that there is no difference between articulation and the articulated, between imminent form and content, is seductive especially as an apology for modern art. But it is scarcely tenable. This becomes evident in the realization that technological analysis does not grasp the spirit of a work even when this analysis is more than a crude reduction to elements and also emphasizes the artwork's context and its coherence as well as its real or putative initial constituents. 
it requires further reflection to grasp that spirit. Only as spirit is art the antithesis of empirical reality as the determinate negation of the existing order of the world. Art is to be construed dialectically insofar as spirit inheres in it, without, however, art's possessing spirit as an absolute or spirits serving to guarantee an absolute to art. Artworks, however much they may seem to be an entity, crystallize between the spi this spirit and its other. In Hegel's aesthetics, the objectivity of the artwork was conceived as the truth of spirit that has gone over into its own otherness and become identical with this otherness. For Hegel, spirit is at one with totality, even with the aesthetic totality. Certainly spirit in artworks is not an intentional particular, but an element like every particular constitutive of an artwork. True, spirit is that particular that makes an artifact art, though there is no spirit without its antithesis. In actual fact, history knows no artworks in which there is a pure identity of the spiritual and the non-spiritual. According to its own concept, spirit in artworks is not pure, but rather a function of that out of which it arises. Those works that appear to embody such identity and are content with it are hardly ever the most important ones. Granted, that which in artworks is opposed to spirit is in no way the natural aspect of its materials and objects. Rather, it is a limit. Materials and objects are as historically and socially performed as are their methods. They are definitively transformed by what transpires in the works. What is heterogeneous in artworks is imminent to them. It is that in them that opposes unity and yet is needed by unity if it is to be more than a pyrrhic victory over the unresisting. That the spirit of artworks is not to be equated with their imminent nexus, the arrangement of their essential elements, is evident in that they are in no way con that in that they in no way constitute that gapless unity, that type of form to which aesthetic reflection has falsely reduced them. In terms of their own structure, they are not organisms. Works of the highest rank are hostile to their organic aspect as illusory and affirmative. In all its genres, art is pervaded by intellective elements. It may suffice to note that without such elements, without listening ahead and thinking back, without expectation and memory, without the synthesis of the discrete and separate, great musical forms would never have existed. Whereas to a certain extent, these functions may be attributed to central immediacy, that is, that particular complexes of elements incorporate qualities of what is antecedent and forthcoming, artworks nevertheless achieve a critical point where this immediacy ends, where they must be thought, not in external reflection, but on their own terms. The intellective mediation belongs to their own central arrangement and determines their perception. If there is something like a common characteristic of great late works, it is to be sought in the breaking through of form by spirit. This is no aberration of art, but rather its fatal corrective. Its highest products are condemned to a fragmentariness that is their confession that even they do not possess what is claimed by the imminence of their form. Objective idealism was the first to stress vigorously the spiritual as against the essential element of art. It thus equated art's objectivity with spirit. In thoughtless accord with tradition, idealism identifies the essential with the accidental. Universality and necessity, which for Kant dictate, even though they remain problematic, became construable for Hegel by means of the omnipotent category of spirit. The progress of this aesthetics beyond all previous thinking is evident just as the conception of art was liberated from the last traces of feudal divestment, its spiritual content, as its principal determination, was at least potentially arrested from the sphere of mere meaning of intentions. Since Hegel conceives of spirit as what exists in and for itself, 
is recognized in art as its substance and not as a thin abstract layer hovering above it. This is implicit in the definition of beauty as the central semblance of the idea. Philosophical idealism, however, was in no way as kindly disposed toward aesthetic spiritualization as the theoretical construction would perhaps indicate. On the contrary, idealism set itself up as the defender of precisely that centrality that in its opinion was being impoverished by spiritualization. That doctrine of the beautiful as the central semblance of the idea was an apology for immediacy as something meaningful and, in Hegel's own words, affirmative. Radical spiritualization is antithetical to this. This progress had a high price, however, for the spiritual element of art is not what idealist aesthetics call spirit. Rather, it is the mimetic impulse fixated as totality. The sacrifice made by art for this emancipation, which pos whose postulate has been consciously formulated ever since Kant's dubious theorem that nothing sensuous is sublime, is presumably already evident in modernity. With the elimination of the principle of representation in painting and sculpture, and of the exploitation of fragments in music, it became almost unavoidable that the elements set free, colors, sounds, absolute configurations of words, came to appear as if they already inherently expressed something. This is, however, illusory, for the elements become eloquent only through the context in which they occur. The superstitious belief in the elementary and unmediated, to which expressionism paid homage and which worked its way down into arts and crafts, as well as into philosophy, corresponds to capriciousness and accidentalness in the relation of material and expression in construction. To begin with, the claim that in itself red possesses an expressive value was an illusion, and the putative expressive values of complex, multitonal sounds were in fact predicated on the insistent negation of traditional sounds. Reduced to natural material, all of this is empty and theories that mystify it have no more substance than the charlatanism of Farbton experiments. It is only the most recent physicalism that, in music for instance, carries out a reduction literally to elements. This is spiritualization that progressively exorcises spirit. Here the self-destructive aspect of spiritualization becomes obvious. While the metaphysics of spiritualization has become philosophically questionable, the concept is at the same time too universal to do justice to spirit in art. Nevertheless, the artwork continues to assert itself as essentially spiritual, even when spirit is for all intents and purposes no longer to be presupposed as a substance. Hegel's aesthetics does not resolve the question of how it is possible to speak of spirit as a determination of the artwork without hypostatizing its objectivity as absolute identity. Thereby, the controversy is, in a sense, referred back to the Kantian court of justice. In Hegel, the spirit of art was deducible from this system as one level of its manifestation and was, as it were, univocal in potentially each and every genre and artwork but only by relinquishing the aesthetic attribute of ambiguity. Aesthetics is, however, not applied philosophy, philosophy, but rather in itself philosophical. Hegel's reflection that the science of art has greater priority than does art itself is the admittedly problematical product of his hierarchical view of the relation of the domains of spirit to each other. On the other hand, in the face of growing theoretical interest in art, Hegel's theorem of the primacy of science has its prophetic truth in art's need of philosophy, the unfolding of its own content. Paradoxically, Hegel's metaphysics of spirit results in a certain reification of spirit in the artwork through the fixation of its idea. In Kant, however, the ambiguity between the feeling of necessity and this fact that this necessity is not a given but something unresolved is truer to aesthetic experience than is Hegel's much more modern ambition of knowing art from within rather than in terms of its subjective constitution from without. 
If this Hegelian philosophical turn is justified, it in no way follows from a systematic subordinating concept, but rather from the sphere that is specific to art. Not everything that exists is spirit, yet art is an entity that through its configurations becomes something spiritual. If idealism was able to requisition art for its purposes by fiat, this was because through its own constitution, art corresponds to the fundamental conception of idealism, which indeed without Schelling's model of art would never have developed into its objective form. Art cannot be conceived without this imminently idealistic element, that is, without the objective mediation of all art through spirit. This sets a limit to dull-minded doctrines of aesthetic realism, realism, just as those elements encompassed in the name of realism are a constant reminder that art is no twin of idealism. Just give me one second. I'm wondering if I should go to this little portrait break here, all the way. Yeah, fine. You know artwork is the element of spirit, something that exists. Rather, it is something in the process of development and formation. Thus, as Hegel was the first to perceive, the spirit of artworks is integrated into an overarching process of spiritualization, that of the progress of consciousness. Precisely through its progressive spiritualization, through its division from nature, art wants to revoke this division from which it suffers and which inspires it. Spiritualization provided art anew with what had been excluded from it by artistic practice since Greek antiquity, the sensuously unpleasing, the repulsive. Baudelaire virtually made this development art's program. Hegel aimed at justifying the irresi irresistibility of spiritualization in the theory of what he called the romantic artwork. Since then, everything essentially pleasing in art, every charm of material has been degraded to the level of the pre-artistic. Spiritualization as the continuous expansion of the mimetic taboo on art, the indigenous domain of mimesis works toward art's dissolution. But being also a mimetic force, spiritualization at the same time works toward the identity of the artwork with itself, thereby excluding the heterogeneous and strengthening its image character. Art is not infiltrated by spirit, rather spirit follows artworks where they want to go, setting free their imminent language. Still, spiritualization cannot free itself of a shadow that demands its critique. The more substantial spiritualization becomes in art, the more energetically, in Benjamin's theory no less than in Beckett's literary praxis, did it renounce spirit, the idea. However, in that spiritualization is inextricable from the requirement that everything must become form, spiritualization becomes complicitous in the tendency that liquidates the tension between art and its other. Only radically spiritualized art is still possible. 
all other art is childish. Inexorably, however, the childish seems to contaminate the whole existence of art. The sensuously pleasing has come under a double attack. On the one hand, through the artwork spiritualization, the external must pass by way of spirit and has increasingly become the appearance of the inward. On the other hand, the absorption of resistant material and themes opposes the culinary consumption of art, even if, given the general ideological tendency to integrate everything that resists integration, consumption undertakes to swallow everything up whole, however repulsive it might seem. In early Impressionism with Manet, the polemical edge of spiritualization was no less sharp than it was in Baudelaire. Big Daddy. The further artworks distance themselves from the childish desire to please. Oh my God. The further artworks distance themselves from the childish desire to please, the more what they are in themselves prevails over what they present to even the most ideal viewer, whose reflexes increasingly become a matter of indifference. In the sphere of natural beauty, Kant's theory of the sublime anticipates the spiritualization that art alone is able to achieve. For Kant, what is sublime in nature is nothing but the autonomy of the spirit in the face of the superior power of sensuous existence, and this autonomy is achieved only in the spiritualized artwork. Admittedly, the spiritualization of art is not a pristine process. Whenever spiritualization is not fully carried out in the concretion of the aesthetic structure, the emancipated spiritual element is degraded to the level of subaltern thematic material. Opposed to the sensuous aspect, Spiritualization frequently turns blindly against that aspect's differentiation, itself something spiritual, and becomes abstract. In its early period, spiritualization is accompanied by a tendency to primitivism and, contrary to sensuous culture, tends towards the barbaric. In their own name, the Fovis made this their program. Regression shadows all opposition to affirmative culture spiritualization in art must prove its ability to rise above this threat of regression and to recover their suppressed differentiation. Otherwise, art deteriorates into a violent act of spirit. All the same, spiritualization is legitimate as the critique of culture through art, which is part of culture and finds no satisfaction in its failure. The function of barbaric traits in modern art changes historically. The good souls who cross themselves in front of reproductions of the Demoiselles d'Avignon, or while listening to Schoenberg's early piano pieces, are without exception more barbaric than the barbarism they fear. Go outside if you want to go outside. As soon as new dimensions emerge in art, they refuse older ones and initially prefer impoverishment and the renunciation of false richness even of highly developed forms of reaction. The process of spiritualization in art is never linear progress. Its criterion of success is the ability of art to appropriate into its language of form what bourgeois society has ostracized, thereby revealing in what has been stigmatized that nature whose suppression is what is truly evil. The perennial indignation, unchanged by the culture industry, over the ugliness of modern art is, despite the pompous ideals sounded hostile to spirit, it interprets the ugliness, and especially the unpleasing reproaches, literally rather than as a test of the power of spiritualization, and as a cipher of the opposition in which this spiritualization proves itself. Rimbaud's postulate of the radically modern is that of an art that moves in the tension between spleen et ideal, between spiritualization and obsession with what is most distant from spirit. The primacy of spirit in art and the inroads made by what has was previously taboo are two sides of the same coin. It's concerned with what has not yet been socially approved and performed, preformed, 
and thereby becomes a social condition of determinate negation. Spiritualization takes place not through ideas announced by art, but by the force with which it penetrates layers that are intentionless and hostile to the conceptual. This is not the least of the reasons why the proscribed and forbidden tempt artistic sensibilities. Spiritualization in new art prohibits it from tarnishing itself any further with the topical preferences of Philistine culture, the true, the beautiful, and the good, into its innermost core what is usually called arts, social critique, or engagement. All that is critical or ne negative in art has been fused with spirit, with the art's law of form. That these elements are at present stubbornly played off against each other is a symptom of the aggression of consciousness. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you again tomorrow. Goodbye.